This is Nightly Business Report with Tyler Matheson and Susie Garib, funded in part by TheStreet.com and Action Alerts Plus, where Jim Kramer and fellow portfolio manager Stephanie Link share their investment strategies, stock picks, and market insights. You can learn more at TheStreet.com slash NBR. Yes, I think they made a mistake. Simple as that. President Obama disagrees with Sony's decision to pull the movie The Interview, as the FBI confirms North Korea was behind the hack. And now some say the impact on business is just starting to be felt. Deep in the heart of Texas, crude prices fall for four straight weeks, down 50% from its highs this year, and perhaps no place is feeling the pressure more than Midland, Texas. Battered and bruised, but ready to break out. Our market monitor has a list of out-of-favor stocks he says may be ready to turn. All that and more tonight on Nightly Business Report for Friday, December 19th. Good evening, everyone. Make it three in a row. Stocks rallied for the third straight day, closing out with the biggest weekly gain since October. Investors are feeling confident ever since Federal Reserve policymakers said they're holding off from raising interest rates. And that confidence fueled more buying on Wall Street today. The S&P 500 index rose almost 3.5% this week and is just five points away from breaking through its all-time record high. For today, the Dow rose 26 points, the Nasdaq gained 17 and the S&P added nine points. For the week, the Dow was up 3 percent. The Nasdaq rose almost 2.5 percent. And as we just mentioned, the S&P moved higher by nearly 3.5 percent. Well, the markets were a huge story this week. But today, from Hollywood to FBI headquarters to the White House, the story everybody was talking about is the big hack attack on and the threats to Sony. Today, in a year-end press conference, President Obama said the company's movie studio, quote, made a mistake by shelving its controversial film, The Interview, following threats from those hackers. The FBI now says North Korea is directly responsible. So, did Sony make the right decision? Will the satirical film ever be shown anywhere? And how will law enforcement react? Julia Borston has the latest from Los Angeles. President Obama saying Sony made a mistake in canceling its theatrical release of The Interview. I wish uh, they had spoken to me first. Uh, I, w I would have told them, do not I'll get into uh, a pattern in which you're intimidated by these kinds of criminal attacks. But in an interview with CNN, Sony Pictures CEO Michael Linton responding, saying the president is mistaken, that he had been in touch with senior White House officials, and the studio very much wants the American public to see the film, saying, quote, we have not caved, we have not given in, we have persevered, and we have not backed down. We have always had every desire to have the American public see this movie. The issue now is that Sony's Linton says they don't own theaters and have no way to get the movie out, saying that while they're considering digital distribution options, not a single distributor has said they'll distribute it. The president saying he is sympathetic to the concerns Sony faced and the company suffered significant damage with threats against its employees, and now the president is weighing a response. They caused a lot of damage, and we will respond. Uh, we will respond proportionally and will respond uh, in a place and time uh, and manner that we choose. The back and forth between the president and Linton come as sources tell me Sony's execs received an email purporting to be from the hackers, saying they'll back off if Sony does not let the movie out in any form, including DVD or piracy. The authenticity of who sent the message has not been verified, but it reads, quote, it's very wise that you made the decision to cancel the interview. It will be very useful for you. We still have your private and sensitive data. We ensure security for your data unless you make additional trouble. But taking Linton at its word, it sounds like Sony is willing to test that threat if he can get a distributor on board. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Julia Borston in Los Angeles. Well, the reputation of Sony Pictures has taken a real beating since that hacking in November, and not just for pulling the interview out of theaters. There's also been the release of damaging emails, closely held movie scripts, and personal data on thousands of employees that will cost the company hundreds of millions of dollars. Now, since the hack, shares of the studio's corporate parent, Sony Corp., are down about 1 percent. So how will Sony's decision to give in, whether Mr. Linton sees it that way or not, to the threats affect other U.S. corporations? Let's find out from J.P. Eggers, 
Uh, he is a professor of management at the uh, you know, New York University's Stern School of Business. Professor, welcome. Good to have you here. I want to get to, to Mr. Linton's point about whether it was really the theaters who caved, not he and his company that did. But let me begin by asking you, how big or bad a precedent is this withdrawal of the movie in terms of other creative endeavors, whether it's a book publisher who pulls a manuscript because Iran doesn't like it, or another, or a, a music publisher that doesn't publish a song because the lyrics offend one group or another? Well, I mean, I, I think it's a potentially very significant effect in the sense that these products become kind of a political argument for a terror group or a foreign government or an ethnic group that disagrees with, with, with a certain idea. And to the extent that these creative companies are going to back down and kind of cave to these wishes, this is going to have an effect in many ways on the creative side of, of the business in the sense that if I'm a producer or an actor or a writer, um, engaging one of these politically sensitive subjects becomes very risky for me because if my movie never gets out, I may never get get paid for for having produced the movie in the first place. Mm -hmm. So, JP, you're talking in many ways. A lot of this is our censorship type of issues for these creative companies. But what about other businesses that are not in at all this Hollywood space? Um, what impact could uh, the Sony moves make on those companies, their products, their businesses? So it's interesting because uh, this has been obviously an issue that's happened uh, around kind of po politics and terrorism in uh, oil and gas and natural resources industries for, for a while. But a number of other industries have not really been affected in this way. And the idea that a product, a service, an offering that a company may want to put out to the public could become an object of kind of political rancor or, or terror attack or something like, like that may be something that, that companies haven't considered as much and will now have to think about as they're making investments along these lines. Let's talk a little bit about where the responsibility lies here, apart from the fact that the real responsibility lies in Pyongyang somewhere. Uh, but, but to the question of whether Sony caved or was it the theater owners that, that really panicked here, what do you think? Well, I mean, obviously, we'll never know exactly, but I could very easily see that the theaters have no good reason to want to show this movie. If they don't, if, if they don't use the theater to show the interview, they can put a different movie in there, and their bottom line will be affected almost to not, to almost not, not at all. And so, given that they're facing an actual risk to their business, it doesn't make any sense for them to show the movie when there's a real risk. Sony's got a much bigger incentive to want the movie to get out because they only will get paid for the movie if they can distribute the movie in some way. But for the theater owners, there's no good reason to want to do it. And so I could very easily see most theater companies having no desire to touch this, this, this mm -hmm. right now. Okay. Real quickly, I mean, um, you know, uh, people, uh, bad people do bad things. Uh, so there's been a lot of talk of what can you do to prevent this kind of thing. And I don't know if, if you can really comment on this, but, but there's talk of legislation. There's talk about more active, uh, proactive uh, work by Homeland Security. I don't know if there are any other cybersecurity things that companies can do. Uh, any I mean, thoughts? I, so certainly, obviously, to the extent that this is a response to the cyber aspect of the, this, this attack and not simply the, the, the terror threats and the violence threats that came out in the emails, um, obviously, big investments and stepping up investments in uh, cybersecurity will help prevent this from happening in the future to some extent. Um, but it's, it, this has become a, a, a difficult and challenging reality, right? So on top of the existing terror threats that may exist, we now get kind of cyber terror threats. And we, you know, the, the hackers tend to stay one mm -hmm. step ahead of the, the, the officials. Sony's Linton, uh, Mr. Eggers, says that he was not, he's not been able thus far to find anybody who wants to distribute the movie. That would include the cable companies, the satellite companies, the Netflixes, uh, the uh, Apple TVs of the world. What do you think if, would happen if some of them did go along with this? Would they, could they be vulnerable? Well, they could be. I mean, obviously, to the extent we're concerned about actual violence against uh, moviegoers, then by not having a physical location like a movie theater, there's less of a clear threat. But certainly for a company like Comcast, who's got its own digital operations, if, the ha if they felt that the hackers might target those operations, at the very least denial of ser service attacks to kind of shut down websites, but more significantly to hack in and steal data to shut down service more, more significantly, there's a significant threat, but it's probably nowhere near as high as it was in the movie theater case by comparison. Professor, thanks. Great as always to see you. J.P. Eggers, New York University's Stern School of Business. Thank you.
More now from the president's year-end press availability at the White House. He said the federal corporate tax system needs to be simpler and more fair. And with incoming Republican majorities in both the House and the Senate, the president is looking forward to making, quote, real reform through Congress. Talking to Speaker Boehner and uh, Leader McConnell, uh, that they are serious about wanting to get some things done. Uh, the tax area is one area where we can get things done. Um, and I think in the coming weeks leading up to the State of the Union, there will be some conversations at the staff levels uh, about what principles each side are looking at. At the top of the agenda will likely be legislation on cross-border mergers known as tax inversions, allowing U.S. companies to slash their tax bills by moving their headquarters out of the country. And Uncle Sam is finally getting out of the auto business. The Treasury is selling the last of its shares in Ally Financial. This is the one-time auto financing arm of General Motors, which it acquired when Ally was bailed out during the financial crisis. The 6 million shares being sold, amounting to 11 percent of the lender, is worth about one and a quarter billion dollars. Well, stocks may have had a very good week, but for oil, this was the fourth in a row prices fell. But they didn't fall today. Crude shot higher this Friday on a rush of buying ahead of the expiration of a four-month contract for crude. Light sweet domestic crude surged 5 percent to close at 57.13 a barrel. Benchmark Brent rose more than $2. It settled back above 61 bucks a barrel. Now, the recent slide in energy prices has already had a major impact on the people and companies in the boom towns that rely on abundant shale oil and natural gas in the Permian Basin in Texas. So could the boom times be nearing an end? Brian Sullivan has more from Midland, Texas. With oil prices continuing to fall, now cut in half off their summer highs, the oil industry here in Texas is starting to feel some strain. And there is perhaps no place in the state that feels it as much as the city of Midland. For the past few years, Midland has been one of the fastest growing cities in the state. It's also got one of the highest average incomes of any place in America. Increased oil prices, improvements in drilling technology, and the controversial practice of fracking have set off a wave of investment in this far west Texas town over the past few years. In every direction here, there are new companies, new construction, building after building of oil rig operators, drillers, service companies, and everything else that is attached to the Permian Basin oil surge. According to Texas Tech University, the Permian boom sustains more than 400,000 jobs and more than 100 billion in total economic output. We asked longtime oil man and local resident Paul Kenworthy if all of this is at risk. Certainly not going to go away entirely, but as you can see from some of the equipment stacked in here, it's certainly going to slow down. And so the extent of the slowdown uh, uh, remains to be seen. But Texas has seen this movie before. In the past two or three decades, there have been a number of oil boom and bust cycles in the state, and those in the oil business do remain optimistic. We're only about 1% oversupplied, and so that will be corrected fairly quickly, I think, uh, during 2015 and early 2016, and then we'll be more of an equilibrium. As the price of oil has fallen, so too have the oil stocks. Though the bigger, older players tend to have much lower cost of production, many of the newer companies may need 50, 60, or even $70 a barrel oil to remain profitable. Investors in these companies and residents of Midland agree on one thing. It's not necessarily how low prices go in the short term, but rather how long they remain at these levels. The longer oil stays in the 50, 60 or even $70 range, the more pressure is going to be put on the Permian and the companies who operate here. From Midland, Texas, for Nightly Business Report, I'm Brian Sullivan. Still ahead, how the opening up of relations with Cuba and potential economic changes could alter the way of life in Havana. Good news today about jobs. Unemployment rates fell in 41 states in November, held steady in six others, and only rose in three, reflecting widespread gains across the whole country. The lowest unemployment rate was in North Dakota, thanks to the shale oil boom, which has a rate of 2.7 percent. The highest jobless rate? Mississippi, 7.3 percent. The biggest gains last month came in California, Florida, and Texas.
An increase in jobs and a boost to the economy may be in store for the people of Cuba now that the U.S. will normalize relations with the island nation. So how else might life change for Cuba's people? Michelle Caruso Cabrera has more from Havana. Every day, hundreds of Cubans line up at the American Interest Section in Havana, applying for permission to go to the United States. Some to visit family, others seek better opportunities. Many Cubans are frustrated by the country's stagnant economy. It's very complicated for me to work here because the only opportunities are here in Havana. She says more people would want to stay if the changes announced this week by President Obama improve life on the island. Those changes include allowing U.S. residents to send more money to family remaining in Cuba and easing some travel restrictions between the two countries. Roughly half a million people traveled from the U.S. to Cuba last year under special licenses issued by the U.S. Treasury, which permit families, religious groups and educational tours. This group of U.S. tourists was in Cuba the day of the historic announcement. Every person we spoke to, the waiters, everybody says, oh, so, they, they light up. They're so happy. We're all they fist bumping, hug. shaking they hands, hugging. They want to hugging. hug and smiles from ear to ear. Also under the changes, payment terms will be easier for the Cuban government, which bought from the U.S. last year more than $3 billion worth of food and medicine. Both are exempt from the embargo. Desperately needed telecom equipment will be easier for Cuba to import. But even with these changes, Cuba will remain one of the most isolated countries in the world. This is one of the most mysterious institutions in Cuba, the central bank. We know very little about it because Cuba doesn't belong to ma any of the major international institutions like the IMF or the World Bank, so they don't have to report things like the reserves or any kind of statistics to anyone. One of the big questions is how much do they have in reserves? Cuba was a founding member of the International Monetary Fund, but abandoned it in the 60s at the behest of then-leader Fidel Castro, who seized all businesses and turned the island into a communist country where everyone had to work for the government. The current regime, led by Fidel's brother Raul, is undoing a very small part of the communist model, but it's still a long way from prosperity and freedom. This is still a regime that represses its people. And as I said when I made the announcement, I don't anticipate overnight changes. Hence why Cubans still line up to leave. Nightly Business Report, Michelle Caruso Cabrera, Havana, Cuba. CARMAX shares surged today thanks to a revenue jump in its third quarter, and that's where we begin tonight's market focus. The nation's largest used car seller's profit and revenue topped estimates. CARMAX said easier availability of credit and more dealership traffic helped to rev up sales. Shares rose 11 percent to $67.32. Shares of Finish Line went the other way after it lowered its earnings outlook for the year and said it would cut spending. The sports apparel retailer cited margin pressure for the forecast. That's because the company had to use discounts to drive sales of items like shoes for running and basketball. The stock plunged 19 percent to 23.35. Well, you won't believe what Citigroup thinks Instagram is now worth. City now values the photo sharing service at $35 billion. Just about two years ago, Facebook bought the company for about $700 million. According to Citi, Instagram is now worth about 49 times what Facebook paid for it, just like my investments. Shares of Facebook popped almost 2 percent to 79.88. Investors bought up shares of Juno Therapeutics in the company's market debut. The cancer drug developer priced 11 million of its shares at $24 a piece, raising more than 260 million. Uh, shares soared. They closed at $35. That's a move of 45 percent. Another cyber attack on a retailer to tell you about. Staples said hackers may have compromised more than a million customer cards by installing malware at more than 100 of its stores. Shares were volatile after hours before the close. Shares were down slightly to 1755. Our market monitor tonight says stocks will rise by as much as 10 percent in the new year, but it'll be a rocky road. He's Sarah Setti, managing director at Douglas C. Lane. Sarah, nice to have you with us. Um, so you're talking about the S&P 500 gaining 200 points in the new year. What's going to drive that? So I think you've got a few positive factors. Uh, one that we've seen in the last month is uh, oil coming down to the 50s. Our view is that oil is probably going to stay in the 60 to 80 range. That is one of the biggest tax cuts that consumers can see, considering that two-thirds of GDP is consumer-driven. That, along with uh, better uh, economic news in terms of employment and earnings, will, uh, will move the market ahead. 
Uh, Mr. Sandy, you, you have three picks that you want to tell us about, all of them uh, basically in the technology space. I would call them really blue chip tech stocks, starting with Qualcomm. Why do you like it and what's your price target? So Qualcomm is our, our value technology stock. It's an out of favor uh, telecom stock. We, we like it for, for multiple reasons. Uh, one is it, it controls the 3G licensing all over the world. Today, you've got an issue in China where China is contesting the licensing. We think that's a short term blip. Once that's resolved, we'll see the stock move probably from where the low 70s it is today to about 85 to 90 where we think it should be. And you also have Stratasys on your on your list, and this is a company that uh, at the beginning of, of this year was trading at $130. Now it's around $80. Where do you see it going, and why should investors put new money in this company? So Stratasys is definitely our growth pick. Uh, it, it's definitely volatile. It's in the 3D additive printing space. There's uh, a lot of competition coming into this area, but we think Stratasys is the leader. Uh, they've definitely by far growing uh, over 20 percent top line and, and earnings growth that we see in the high teens to 20 percent for the next three years. Given what you've seen around uh, this industry, we want to be with the leader. We want to be with a company that's investing in growing its business, not just using financial engineering. And speaking of leaders, your third choice is Google. What's your price target on it and why do you like it? So Google for us is, uh, we think this, this stock should be at least $650 to $700. Uh, we like it. It's a three-prong approach for Google, really. Uh, they're the leader in search. Uh, that, we think, is going to grow, especially as mobile keeps on growing. Secondly, um, they're big uh, in um, Android, which we think is, is growing even faster. Uh, Android is being used not just in mobile, but it's being used today. You saw the announcement in cars. It's really the software that's driving a lot of the growth. And then thirdly, YouTube. YouTube is something that, that when they mm -hmm. bought for, for very cheap is now growing very fast and completely, we think, undervalued uh, within Google. Uh, real quickly, we have about 30 seconds left. Uh, these stocks that you're talking about, you say that the markets will go up, but it will be a bumpy ride. Um, if investors buy these now, should they just stick it out, hold it all the way through the year, or is there a point at which they should sell and just take profits? So uh, we would like to own these. These are companies, I think, for the next three to five years you should own, and, and definitely good entry points today. You might get an opportunity, especially when you've seen the market volatility in the last three months, mm -hmm. to buy some more. But I would, I would at least initiate a position in these today, and, and I think three to five years from now, uh, we, we think you'll be pretty comfortable with what the price targets will be at that point. You know, sir, we don't usually get people thinking that far out, so thank you so much for your <laughs> forecast. Have a great weekend. Thank you so much. Sarah thank Seti you. with Douglas C. Lane. And coming up on the program, how a 100-year-old company has been able to keep its edge over new arrivals and produce one of the hottest products of the year. Chrysler is expanding an already massive recall of vehicles to replace potentially deadly driver's side airbags made by Japan's Takata Corporation. After pressure from U.S. safety officials, Chrysler is now recalling 3.3 million various cars, trucks, and SUVs worldwide, not just in high humidity regions. Most of the recall vehicles are in the U.S. from the model years 2004 through 2007. And finally tonight, a century-old product made by a family-owned business in Maine is suddenly the hit of the holiday season. So can L.L. Bean keep up with this newfound demand? Courtney, Re Courtney Reagan has the story from Maine. L.L. Bean was founded in 1912 on this boot. And more than 100 years later, this boot is hotter than ever. The production level has gone up uh, for the popularity of L.L. Bean boots. and. Um, just staff changes here and there, but um, other than that, we're still doing, I guess, making the boots the way we were still 100 years ago. L.L. Bean has been doing a lot of things the same way for 100 years. It's still a private company based in Maine making classic items like the boots, the famous chamois shirt, and those iconic tote bags, along with legendary customer service. It's not a big secret. Uh, it's great product. It's quality. Super service, wonderful uh, online uh, process, 
Um, you order it, you get it, it's quick. Um, it's always of great quality. At least orders are usually fulfilled quickly. L.L. Bean says there have been backlogs before, but never at the current magnitude for the bean boot. Here at the Brunswick Main Factory, L.L. Bean is working to double the capacity for the rubber bottom, adding a third shift, increasing the number of boot makers by 55 percent, all to meet demand for roughly half a million orders expected this year. A lot of that fueled by college fashionistas. There's a look out there right now that's sort of fashioned after the lumberjack kind of look. And the original L.L. Bean Bean Boot happens to be the one key piece that starts that, um, that look and gets it together. And the other part of it is all L.L. Bean. I mean, it's about flannel shirts. People are wearing them tucked in and untucked, and, but bean boots are really the thing that make that look come to life. When it comes to retail, staying power is one of the trickiest parts of the business. But L.L. Bean has successfully found its niche without adapting to fashion trends. And this time, fashion is adapting to L.L. Bean. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Courtney Reagan in Brunswick, Maine. Nice to see an American manufacturer doing so well still yeah. today. I have a pair. I've had them for probably 30 years. Time to buy a new one. Oh, maybe so. <laughs> That's Nightly Business Report for tonight. I'm Susie Garib. Have a great weekend, everyone. And I'm Tyler Matheson. Have a great weekend. We'll see you here on Monday. Nightly Business Report has been funded in part by... TheStreet.com and Action Alerts Plus, where Jim Cramer and fellow portfolio manager Stephanie Link share their investment strategies, stock picks, and market insights. You can learn more at TheStreet.com slash NBR. I'm Susie Garib with a nightly business report news brief. President Obama called Sony's decision to pull the satirical movie The Interview a mistake as the FBI confirms that North Korea was behind the hack attack. On Wall Street today, stocks rose for a third session in a row as investors embraced the Fed's decision to keep record low interest rates right where they are. The Dow rose 26 points, the Nasdaq gained 17, the S&P added 9 points and is now just 5 points away from breaking through its all-time record high. The Treasury is selling the last of its shares in Ally Financial, acquired when it was bailed out during the financial crisis. And Chrysler is expanding a recall of vehicles to replace potentially deadly driver-side airbags to 3.3 million cars worldwide. Be sure to tune in to Nightly Business Report right here on your public television station.